So the discussion this evening is one that I did about two and a half years ago and chose to do it again. Um, and this is based on an article by uh, Karen Armstrong uh, in her book, which, well, for the people who are here, The Lost Art of Reading Scripture, Rescuing the Sacred Texts, published in 2019. The discussion is about, uh, I'm sorry, go to the next one. And the discussion is about scripture, sacred writings, not just about sutra. Um, Buddhist written sacred discourses by Shakyamuni Buddha, but the subject of sacred writings taken as a whole. In examining this, we encounter how the Buddhist canon fits into a larger whole of wisdom teachings. I wanted to discuss Karen Armstrong's book, The Lost Art of Reading Scriptures, when it first came out. However, it is 500 pages <laughs> um, plus book with a you know 20 to 40 minute presentation i couldn't do it justice uh not to the author not to the not to the people attending and so karen adapted an article that was then published in tricycle the following year i think it was summer of 2020 and so I used that as a format, but then filled in the missing pieces from the book. The interesting thing about that was that even the article, which was much shorter, I don't know how many pages it was, 10 pages or whatever, even that could take you down many rabbit holes because Karen's such an interesting writer and you just want to, you know, go along with it. Um, so as a result, I follow somewhat the article that she wrote, but then I supplemented with the book and I referenced the book more than the article. And this evening, we're not going to be discussing scripture as literature, which many people, of course, do, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's not as the knowledge that we obtain from it, or even as the historic mythos, though we may refer to these things along the way. I am going to follow the flow of Armstrong to further understand the article, but also to present some ideas that I think expand on, for Buddha, from a Buddhist perspective, that expand on some of Armstrong's writings. And I'll start by saying that the sacred is called a more enhanced state of being, and this is a good place to start. From the article, the deep-seated human learning for transcendence, and this is a quote, the deep-seated human yearning for transcendence and transformation is a major theme of scripture, as are descriptions of ways of achieving these. Today, we are less ambitious than we were most of our past. We want to be slimmer, healthier, younger, and more attractive than we really are. And we feel that a better self lurks beneath our lamentably, 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 there we go, for imperfect one. We want to be kinder, braver, more brilliant, and charismatic. But scriptures go further, unquote. In other words, what she's saying is that when we look at scripture today, we don't read it the way that it was often intended. We look at it in the way that we look at sort of self-help programs, if you will. In other words, we look at what, what's a better me? A better me is a me that looks better. A me is a book is a person who has a better physique or the me that is da 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 da. And that's not what scripture is doing. Scripture is trying to deep, deeply go into that sense of the need for transcendence and transformation, not the transformation of the physical, but for tr transformation of the spirit. And I think that that's one of the, the difficulties we have, that there's, there's many others that we'll talk about. So in the book, she begins, there are, are really four parts, three, three parts and then a final chapter. Um, and in the first, Cosmos and Society, Armstrong sets up <laughs> to look at Israel, India, and China. And these centers of civilization created and developed very different forms of scripture 
consistent with the differences in belief about life in the universe held by each of the cultural regions that we thanked, and we'll be discussing this in a moment. The second part is mythos, and that provides us with a central theme that we find in each of the preceding elements of the cosmos and society explored through scripture, which is myth slash history and aspiration. And there were, I think, four or five chapters dealing specifically with mythos, whereas there were three chapters dealing in the cosmos society. And then the third, logos, has really two chapters, and this is really uh, a longer, these are the longer chapters of the book. And they discuss why scripture are largely misunderstood today. And these two sections give us insight into how our worldview has marginalized scripture. And then finally, there is a chapter by itself titled Post Scripture. And this chapter discusses what we can do to recapture the art of scripture. If I were to provide a summary of Armstrong's presentation, it would be the William Blake quote that we see on the screen. Do you see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower? Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Stop and think about that. It, certainly it's poetry, but it provides imagery which goes far beyond descriptive. And so I think that that's, that's where we, we want to really proceed with this. So we'll begin with the chapter on cosmos and society. Uh, Israel, remembering in order to belong. And, and I, have, I want to make a comment about this, that to put into context the foundations of uh, Judaism, we have to remember that as a tradition, as a monotheistic tradition, it started specifically asserting that there was a single God. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad is a very basic, that's the, the, the Shema is the very basic um, belief that's used in Judaism. Hear, O Lord, the Lord my God, the Lord is one. And this was really quite uh, contrary to most of the traditions that existed at that time with the Hittites and, and, and others who believed in multiple gods. And you think of the Romans, the Roman gods, the Greek gods, that sort of thing. So this really was, was set apart. But in order to, the reason it's in order, in order to belong, that what we see in that Judaic view was not just the belief in one God, but a need to belong with each other. And I would maintain that when we look at many of the mitzvot, such things as the laws of kosherit, they were written partly, I mean, there were many, not just I break the kosher laws down into three parts. Um, but often we look at it in the logos today, we look at it in the, in the practice and say, oh, that's because Jews were afraid they were going to get parasites. It's nonsense. Because the beef had parasites as well as pigs did. You know? And so that, that's sort of, that's our logical mind that works with that. Kosher had a lot to do with, if, I can't, if we can't eat together, we're not going to have the same relationships. That was one of the aspects of kosher. I can't eat if I'm keeping kosher. I can't eat at Dan's house if he doesn't have kosher, if he doesn't keep kosher. That's therefore going to mean that I'm going to hang out with my friends, not with the friends over there, those Hittite sorts of folks, you know, whatever it was. I'm not saying that in a pejorative way. It was looking at society in a particular fashion. So Israel is a reference to the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, and Christianity, and Islam. And the scripture emerged when human beings started to live in larger and more complex society. As a result, they needed a common ethos that would bind them together, whether we're talking about Jews, Christians, or Muslims. And the early civilizations were founded in the Middle East in the fourth century millennia BC. And at that time, all states and empires were based economically on agriculture and were being maintained only by ruthless exploitation of peasants. Yeah, a small aristocracy and their retainers seized all the surplus grown by the peasants 
and forced 90% of the population to live at subsistence levels. This created a privileged class with leisure to create arts and sciences on which progress depended. So um, starting the fourth century BCE, we had the elites who were utilizing the labor of the peasants, of the non-elites. We talk about the 1% today. Well, they're saying that only 90% of the population was forced to live in subsistence. I think we've gotten worse if it's 1% today, I'm not sure. But actually, we have a much bigger middle class today. Actually, we have a middle class today. So that, that's a big um, improvement. But one of the civilized arts was scripture. That's the point. And it depended upon the civilized science of ritual in the pre-modern world. We don't think about ritual as a form of science, but it was at the time. The narratives were intended to bind people to Yahweh, later to Jesus Christ, and later yet to Muhammad. And they presented a world of deliverance from the brutal world around them. When we look at the Abrahamic traditions, they're about deliverance. This life sucks. Amen. In the next life, <laughs> Things are going to be so much better, right? It's deliverance. It's a way of looking, trying to trying to make it through the day. You know, I just have to keep struggling along, and then sometime in the future, it's going to be, get better. The fact that I've got to die first is it all. Anyway, in India, we have sound and silence. India refers to the Indian subcontinent, which includes the Indic subcontinent, west of Persia, what is now Pakistan. And these were the so-called Aryan groups of peoples. And so what we think of as India, the state of India, of course, we know <laughs> broke with a partition in 1948 into what at that time was East Pakistan and West Pakistan. But the Indian teachings went all the way over to Afghanistan, Kazakhstan. Um, I, I think I spoke recently about how we find Buddhist images in Alexandria, Egypt. It, the, the teachings went all over the place. And I made a, a, a point um, during one of the retreats in the last two weeks that, in fact, many of the early Europeans who were first investigating Buddhism were really confused because they did find these images in Egypt. And they thought, in fact, that Buddha was African. And it didn't, it, it, it was sort of um, emphasized that the features looked like African features as opposed to what we would think of as Indian features, the physiognomy. And, and so um, that's because it traveled so quickly. But the Europeans didn't find out about it until, of course, the you know, 16th, 17th century, etc. The area was settled around 1500 BCE by the people from the Caucasian steppes and settled into what is now Pakistan. Um, so some of David's uh, relatives were involved in that process. Sorry? Some of your... Yeah. <laughs> they were the so-called Aryan groups of people. And the Rig Veda was the earliest scripture. The Rig Veda is translated as knowledge in verse. And these hymns, though largely incomprehensible to people today, are still recited with precise total accents and inflections of the original together with richly prescribed gestures of the arms and fingers. And of course, we know that this, from this region, Buddhism also arose in the fifth century BCE. And of course, when we talk about um, recited with precise total accents and inflections of the original, we have to remember that, that this scripture was all oral. The Rig Veda was not written <clears throat> down until about the second century BCE. Um, and in India, the recit recitation of mantras used to tree achieve the transition from the worldly analytical left hemisphere of the brain to a deeper and more intuitive form of consciousness. Something we don't think about when we're reciting mantra. And according to Armstrong, she sees it as really a neurophysiologic process in which the mantra itself is 
processing the information in the brain in a way which is different from our conversation right now. So the meaning of the word was not important. How many times have people said to me, well, what does this mantra really mean? And I've said, who cares? Don't worry about it. That's not the point. Because the mantra is symbolic and points to something other than itself. In other words, we look at the mantra and want to know, what am I saying? Which is, you know, a reasonable thing to in today's world. But that's looking at it through a very different lens. It's rather the physical vibrations of the recitation that over time stills the rational activity of the brain. So when we're going om ah hum at the end of the service, that om ah hum is actually vibrating in different chakra within the body. That's one way of explaining it. That would be the, the uh, Indic way of explaining it, that it's vibrating at. Armstrong is maintaining that not only that, but the physical vibration of that is actually having an effect, again, on the rational activity, presumably in the frontal lobe of the brain. China, the primacy of the ritual. Again, in China, we're referring to East Asia, including what is today China. Remember, throughout, from the time of the Han Dynasty, from about 200 BCE, to about 200 CE, going forward, China was not the way we see it today. It was different kingdoms in different areas, and the capital moved frequently with whatever group happened to conquer and occupy the next group. It wasn't always just getting more and more and more. It was shifting from one place to the other. Now, these other kingdoms were also what we think of as China today, However, the learning that was imposed at that time was shifting from place to place. It, it, it's really fascinating. You can, you can go online and look at a timeline of China, a chronological timeline of China, and see where China was, let's say, at the time of the Han Dynasty, into the Warring States period, then et cetera, et cetera, and just the, the the capital changes, the center of activity changes. But that also meant that all these people who were being influenced by the scripture uh, at that time were bringing into it new information, and information was being brought to the scripture. So it was all this information was going both ways. Sometimes, in fact, ritual was regarded as far more important than scripture in China. Traditions such as Chan, what we refer to as Zen Buddhism today, find scripture entirely dispensable, but the ritual was rarely discarded. In the past, those reformers who rejected the ceremonial rituals of the day nearly always replaced, replaced them with new rituals. The Buddha, for instance, had no time for the Brahmin's elaborate Vedic sacrifices, but required his monks to so ritualize their everyday physical actions that the way they walked, spoke, or washed expressed moral beauty and grace. That's what ritual was. What ritual was, in, in this context that, that Armstrong was talking about it, ritual itself was scripture. We think about that as a separate activity. But that, according to Armstrong, was ritual. Now, Armstrong doesn't mention this. However, it's a good time to note that Tiantai Buddhism arose in large measure as a means of counter, countering the disregard of the scripture, Buddhist scripture, of the Chan Buddhists in the 6th century CE. That was the rise of Tiantai Buddhism, was specifically for that purpose. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Mythos, this is the longest and most detailed part of the book, consisting of almost half the body. Each chapter is worthy of a presentation in and of itself. And so we're not going to get out of here tonight until midnight. <laughs> <laughs> the picture that you see on the upper right-hand corner is the picture of El Brujo. 
As soon as the first humans learned to manipulate tools, <coughs> they created works of art to make sense of the terror, wonder, and mystery of their existence. From the very beginning, art was inextricably, inextricably bound up with what we call <coughs> religion, which is in itself an art form. And this photo from the the Shao Caves is a cultic site dated between 17,000 to 15,000 BCE. And it falls within the Upper Paleolithic period in what is today southwestern France. And the hybrid creature that we see in the, the illustration transcends anything in our empirical experience, but seems to reflect, according to the anthropologists, a sense of underlying unity of animal, human, and the divine. From the very beginning, men and women deliberately cultivated perception of, of existence that differed from the empirical. Humans have an instinctive appetite for the sacred and a more enhanced state of being. There is no group of people on earth that does not have some way of identifying the sacred. Now, it doesn't have to be in one of the universal religions. It can be in many of the local religions. Native Americans would be an example of this. Shinto would be an example of this. The local religions within China or uh, Vietnam or in South America. How do we define the sacred? And we find that that sacred often is found in combination, although let's say the, the Roman Catholic Church may not have liked it very much. But when Africans came to, to South America, when they went to Brazil, which was the largest slave port in the Americas, they mixed Pondomble, which was a um, Yoruba religious set of rituals and practices. They mixed it with Roman Catholicism. And it's really interesting. Everybody thinks about Carnival and Rio de Janeiro. It's, a, it's actually takes place all over all over Brazil. But to think of Carnival in Rio de Janeiro, and up until, I think it was the late, late 1950s, early 1960s, Carnival was forbidden in Brazil because it was seen as a pagan ritual. Uh, and the Catholic Church really didn't care for that very much. But then they realized that there wasn't much they could do with it. And there's a lot to be made from all those tourists. <laughs> so, so Carnival now becomes a really big thing, but in, in its original form, it was actually part of, of a condomble ritual that was used, used in Brazil. Uh, that was a Yoruba that goes back to West Africa. How many millennia before had Yoruba been present? is anyone's anyone's guess the myths and rituals sacred texts and ethical practices of religion develop a plan of action whereby people reach beyond themselves to connect with the true and ultimate reality it will save them from destructive forces of everyday existence that's a quote what armstrong was talking about here is what i was referring to earlier everyday existence could be really a well, and it still can be a very trying period of time. And we reach for the sacred as a way to bring something further into our lives to give us hope, to give us a sense of purpose, to give us meaning, to give us a sense of, of who we are in some cases. And living with what is ultimately real and true, people have found that they are not only better able to bear these destructive tensions, but that life itself requires new depth and purposes. The myth of scriptures are not designed to confirm your beliefs. That's where we run into problems. Again, the myths of scripture are not designed to confirm your beliefs. Rather, they are calling for radical transformation of mind and heart. We're looking in our sacred text doesn't matter what the religion is, or a rationale for doing something. That was never the intention of the scripture. The intention of the scripture was a 
radical transformation of the self. And I think that when we are, and, and, I, and I use the term here, radical transformation, the myth of scripture not designed to confirm our beliefs, rather they are calling for a radical transformation of heart and mind. In Buddhism, we refer to that as heart, mind, and spirit. That which is within us that is beyond the intellect. <coughs> what we're doing here is going beyond the intellect. Sometimes we like to think there is nothing except the intellect. Scriptures assert that there is something beyond <coughs> that. And I included in the picture down below on the right corner uh, is a picture of Yogen. And Yogen is the 18th Zasu, chief abbot of Enrakuji in the 10th century. Um, and he's famous uh, within, within Buddhism in Japan because he revitalized uh, Tendai at a time in which it had fallen uh, in the 10th century. And on the right, you'll see on the left is a picture of Yogen as he was portrayed. But on the right of that, you'll see this formed image. It's a character that portrays Yogan as a wrathful deity. That image was done by Yogan himself. He was looking in the mirror, and that's the way he saw himself. That's a that's that I don't know if that specific one, that may be a character of another character, but that particular image was done is something that he he um, um, he created. And it is said that the portrait of him on the right is subjugating vengeful ghosts. In other words, the idea was if he was going to fight against, quote, evil, unquote, then he had to take on the images of evil to fight evil, hence the, the horn. And it's, it's interesting when you're traveling in Japan, you come across a, a temple or, and actually, a, a surprising occasion, uh, Shumon and I were, I don't even remember where we were, so I think it was someplace in Muragi Prefecture, and we just <coughs> gone at a, at a spot that was a, a more of a shrine than really a temple. Uh, it was a shrine near the side of the road. And there's that image of Yogen that had been reproduced, the Tendai image of Yogen found within this particular shrine. Um, the myths or narratives are a way of envisioning, envisioning the mysterious reality of the world that we cannot grasp conceptually. They're a way to envisage the mysterious reality of the world we cannot grasp conceptually. And the narrative comes alive when enacted in ritual without which they can seem abstract or even alien. Myth and ritual are so intertwined that it is a matter of scholarly debate as to which came first, the mythical story or the rights attached to it. Thanks, please. And now we come to Logos. And as I said, this is the third part of the book, and it's really broken into two sections. Excuse me. Our modern society is rooted in logos or reason, which must relate precisely to factual, objective, and empirical reality if it's to function efficiently in the world. In the prevalence of logos in modern society, along with the rationalized education, has made the scripture problematic. In the very early West, people began to read the narratives of the Bible as though they were logical factual accounts of what happened. That was never the intention. Somehow, you know, if, if you pick up a book on geology, I'm just picking something out of, you know, out of the blue, you pick up a book on geology, you anticipate that that book is going to describe rocks and minerals and materials in a very factual, precise fashion, which hopefully it will. And that's useful. We need to have that. That's the intention, but that's not the intention of scripture. And so there's sola scripture. These are the two chapters in this part. 
sola scripture, which scripture alone is authoritative for the faith and practice. Scriptural narratives never claim to be accurate descriptions of the creation of the world. It was never intended to say in seven days, God created the world, first he created light, and then da 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 The evolution of species, the exact historical biographies, precise historical writings is a recent phenomenon. It's actually from the 19th century. What we think of as historical, of, of scientific history, started in the 19th century. And I've discussed, I, I, I think I discussed that fairly recently about the, how that came about. So I'm not going to go into it right now. Solo, sola, ratio, the deconstruction of faith and belief. For our simple ideas, which are the foundation and sole matter of our mm -hmm. notions and knowledge, we must depend wholly on our reason. I mean, our natural faculties and can be no means receive them or any of them from any traditional revelation. That's according to Spinoza. So the quote is, for simple ideas, which are the foundation and sole matter of our notions and knowledge, we must depend wholly on our reason. I mean, our natural faculties and can be no means, by no means receive them or any of them from traditional revelation. And you see a picture of Spinoza there. And from the Oxford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Baruch Spinoza is one of the more important philosophers of the early modern period. His extremely naturalistic views on God, the world, the human being, knowledge, served to ground a moral philosophy, centered on the control of the passions leading to virtue and happiness. They also laid the foundations of the strongly democratic political thought and deep critique of the pretensions of scripture and sectarian religion. Of all the philosophers of the 17th century, Spinoza was the most relevant today. Unquote. Spinoza was raised <clears throat> in a Sephardic Jewish Portugal community in Amsterdam, and he developed highly controversial ideas regarding the authenticity of the Hebrew Bible and the nature of the divine. This is the guy that we can point to and say he did it. He's the one who's responsible for how we look at scripture today in a, in a more logos oriented way. So Spinoza, a Sephardic Jew, one of my, my ancestors. ancestors. Yeah, go ahead, blame me. I'm also responsible yeah. for killing Jesus. So there it is. Yeah. Okay. I know you did. Next, please. <laughs> that was a Lenny Bruce, yeah. Lenny Bruce uh, comment, by the way. Um, Lenny, Lenny Bruce started one of his routines by saying, that's it. I'm Jewish. I admit it. I killed Jesus. Let's go, let's go on from there. <laughs> Post scripture. In many ways, we seem to be losing the art of scripture in the modern world. Instead of reading it to achieve transformation, we use it to confirm our own views. For many, or many, one's religion is right and that of our antagonist is wrong. Or in the case of skeptics, religion is unworthy of serious consideration. Scripture has never yielded clear univocal messages or lucid incontrovertible doctrine. On the contrary, Scripture was usually regarded as an indication that can only point to the ineffable. Sometimes it even forces us to experience the shock of total unknowing. We see this just as one example in one of India's most popular scriptures, the Mahabharata, which induces a spiritual and conceptual vertigo, or the Mahayana Buddhism, which rigorously rejected essentialism and produced a multifarious canon demonstrated insistently that all our most basic, basic assumptions about the world are untenable. And I could go on about that, but I'm running over to the next slide, please. And I'm just going to go through the conclusions <clears throat> relatively quickly. <clears throat> conclusions. The purpose of scripture was not to confirm the reader or listener in their firmly held opinions, but to transform them, transform them utterly. 
the art of scripture demanded that it issued positive, practical actions. Otherwise, it was stopped. Its natural dynamic frustrated. In India, Buddhists devised a form of yoga in which the practitioner extended loving kindness to all quarters of the world until she had achieved a state of perfect equanimity and partiality toward all creatures. The Quran gave Muslims a divine mission to create a just and compassionate society in which wealth was shared fairly and the poor and vulnerable were treated with respect. Scholars suggest, and I agree, that the rapid rise of Islam around the world in the 20 and 21st century is a direct response to colonialization and the socioeconomic disparities that exist due to capitalist excesses. In modern secular society, the privatization of faith has overturned the dynamic intention of this scriptural genre. Secularization, separation of religion and politics could have benefited religion by liberating it from the inherent injustice of the state, but secularization was, has not inspired a prophetic critique of society. Instead, by reducing religion to a private search, it seems to, and this is a quote from uh, uh, Armstrong, by reducing religion to a private, uh, to a private search, it seems to have subjectified and even trivialized the art of scripture Unquote. Instead of exportating egotism from the psyche, yoga has become a form of exercise or means of easing personal tension and improving flexibility. Mindfulness designed, designed to teach Buddhist anatta, not self, that the self we prize so dearly is illusory and non-existent, is now used to help people feel more centered and comfortable in themselves. In fact, reinforcing the individualized self. The old scriptural idea of kenosis seems to be in abeyance. Scripture, when practiced as art, is language made numinous. Scriptures are, as they always have been, works in progress, which draw on the past to give meaning to the present. The message of scripture is not cast in stone, and no scriptural text has all the answers. Next. Uh, I'm sorry, even the inspired words of scripture must eventually segue into silence. This is an expression of awe, wonder, and unknown. I did that a little too quick. Now you can go on. And I just provided you <coughs> some of the sources that were used, primarily Armstrong with Lopez is the Lotus Sutra bibliography, Miles, a God, a bibliography. By the way, it's, that's a fascinating, a fascinating work. Um, Mizuno, Buddhist Sutras, Origin, Development, Transmission, and Wallace, Religion and Anthropological View. 